CataractCoach.com, podcast number 21 with Priya Matthews. Priya is a young ophthalmologist in Florida, specializing in cataract, refractive, corneal surgery, anterior segment surgery, and she's a key opinion leader. I've seen her speak on the podium multiple times, and I've always been impressed. It seems like she has just a beautiful balance of work life, personal life, family life. She blends it all together so seemingly easily. And I just thought to myself, wow, when I was her age, I didn't quite get that. As you know, my history in the past, when I've been very involved in ophthalmology, I've gone from one extreme to the other, from overly involved in ophthalmology and traveling the world and neglecting other aspects of life to the opposite side, where I focused only on my family, neglected ophthalmology. And then now, finally, as my kids are out of the house and grown up, I've kind of found a happy medium where I balance my personal life and my ophthalmology life. And I learned a lot from speaking with Priya. Now, she's an incredible young surgeon with a ton of talents and a lot of very keen insight that she brings to the ophthalmology world. And I bet if you're in your 30s or 40s, you will learn something very valuable from this podcast from Priya about how you can achieve that balance between work and life, family and ophthalmology, and overall, enjoy your life better. Check it out. Welcome to our Cataract Coach Podcast. And today our special guest is Dr. Priya Matthews from Florida. Priya's an amazing young ophthalmologist who has a finesse for balancing the work and life and family and personal things that I kind of never had at that age. I'm doing much better now that I'm after age 50, but if you can learn these skills and you can benefit from this conversation in your 30s or 40s, I promise it'll make your life better. So Priya, welcome and thank you for doing this podcast. Uday, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. I'm glad that you think I have it balanced because I sure feel like I'm just balancing on one leg all the time and just trying to survive, but you know, I'd love to share what I've learned over the past few years with your audience. Yeah, for sure. I think, listen, I think we all sometimes feel that way. It's normal to have like this self doubt and like exasperated. There's so many things going on at once and somehow at the end all kind of works out. But I think, I think we, we should give ourselves a little bit more credit that we do a pretty good job of bouncing these things up. But starting off, tell me about your path in ophthalmology. So what, how, where, where, the, where did you train? How did you end up in ophthalmology? Why not neurosurgery or family practice? Yeah, so I've always been interested in medicine from a young age. My mom was a nurse, a NICU nurse. And out of everyone I knew, she just came home happy. You could mm. tell that she felt fulfilled by her work with other people. And that's how I started getting interested in it. I always had a natural passion for medicine, for science. And that just grew as I learned more throughout college. I went to med school at Hopkins and I always thought I wanted to be a pediatrician. I mean, I was that person that I came in. I'm like, I already know what I want to do. You know, I, I, I think I was part of the pediatrics club, that, that kind of thing. And then during my third year, I had a one week rotation with, for ophthalmology um, at Wilmer Eye Institute. And that just literally changed my life because I realized wow, there's this whole other world of surgery, specifically microsurgery, where you're using both of your hands, both of your feet, and you have a craft, and you get to see the result the next day. Yeah. And immediate gratification. For sure. And, uh, you know, it's, it was just so exciting to see the patient the next day and be like, wow, they can actually see. So I realized it pretty late in my third year. Um, so I wasn't one of those people that always knew I wanted to do it. So I decided to um, actually take a year off. I had to do that because I wasn't prepared, you know, to apply that same year. Oh, that's when you and did your MPH. Same... Yes. Gotcha. Exactly. So I'm like, well, you know, I can't really tell my parents I'm taking a year off and just, you know, <laughs> bumming around. <laughs> but um, actually, I was really interested in public health as well. I'd done several mission trips to... Haiti and uh, Philippines, other places, and that I knew that I wanted to incorporate public health in my, in my career. And specifically, I had an interest in clinical research and statistics. So uh, Dr. Pradeep Ramalu, you might know him sure. uh, at Wilmer, and Dr. Asin Akpek, they were my mentors during my MPH year. And that's where I learned how to do my own statistics and you know, do large-scale studies. 
And, um, and that's when I really learned, dove into the ophthalmology world. And then afterwards, I went to Columbia for residency. It was amazing. Um, we had a four-person class. Wow. So not only did I um, you know, graduate from the ophthalmology residency there, I also met my husband, who was my co-resident. Oh, how fun is and that? Then, I love it. Yeah. And then uh, we both actually went to Wilmer, back to Wilmer for our fellowship in Cornea. So do you specialize in right eyes and he does left eyes? How does that work? Right. <laughs> A lot of people ask us that. We have had a few patients that one does one eye, but um, actually it, it's been really great. You know, when he was interested in cornea, I said, are you sure? I mean, why don't you do retina or glaucoma? But we both just really liked, you know, refractive surgery, LASIK, cornea. So uh, we both did it and uh, we both moved to Florida and we were actually practicing separately for the first three years. And then now we're at the same practice at Center for Sight in Sarasota, Florida. Oh, that's a busy practice. You're working hard. Working hard, loving it, loving it. Yeah, for fantastic. anyone who hasn't visited Sarasota, come here. I mean, it's a wonderful place to not just practice, but also raise a family. Uh, beautiful weather. It's pretty hot today, but it, it's nice. I, I really enjoy it. Yeah, that begs the question. So you're in a group now that is known to be a very high surgical volume group. So undoubtedly, you're doing at least a thousand, if not more, cases a year. Tell us about your surgical yeah. volume. It's, it's been really a wonderful opportunity. Uh, I'm so grateful. So I'm doing about 1,500 cataracts a year, about anywhere from 40 to 50 cornea transplants, about 300 LASIK a year. It's, it's, it's more than I ever imagined, to be honest. You know, yeah. I feel very grateful. It's kind of like you just keep ramping up. And, um, you know, when you try your best and, 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 and the word starts getting out and you start getting friends of patients that you had, and it's it's really exciting. So I've been very grateful to not just be in a great city, but also in a great practice which values efficiency and has a really good system for taking care of patients. Well, I think the key there is efficiency. When I first started my practice right out of residency, if you had told me that volume of surgery, I would say, well, you're obviously working 100, 120 hours a week. But clearly you're not. So. The key there is to be efficient, to get that much surgery done in a year. So the 1,500, you're doing like 30-ish cataracts a week, uh, four, four, five, six LASIK a week, and a cornea or two a week. It's a busy, that's a busy clip. It's a busy practice. And I think that the key is having a really wonderful, well-trained team who's committed. Yeah, the team is so, the key. I, the team is the key. Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 my team is like my family. You know, we have seven people and they all work so hard. They're so well trained. And then the optometrists that we work with, they are fantastic. And I never really worked with optometrists until I moved down to Florida. But they've, they're very, very well trained. I mean, I'm talking about culturing ulcers, you know, uh, managing glaucoma. They're wonderful. We have a really good uh, communication with one another that they can call me anytime. So, they're trusted partners, and together the patient really feels like they're getting the best care. And yeah. I think they are. Yeah, the patient gets the whole team, not just one player. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. So now, what's your work schedule like, and then how do you manage? I know you've got young children, too. How do you manage all that? That's such a challenge. It is. It's been, it's a, it's been a process, and it's continuing to evolve. So right now, currently, you know, the first few years, I just worked five days a week, all the time, day and night. Sure. But right now, what's really helped me is I'm working four days a week. Mm -hmm. And so I have Mondays off, which allows me to do other things, not just within ophthalmology, but also outside of ophthalmology. So I'm able to take, you know, have breakfast with the kids, take them for doctor's appointments. But also I have, for example, a nonprofit organization that I co-founded, um, which has to do with cornea transplants and increasing the access of it internationally that I have meetings every Monday. Um, I work with a few companies consulting. I do those meetings on Mondays as well. Um, you know, I'll do self-care things, get a haircut. <laughs> you know, I never had the luxury of doing that before. I was all, the past 10 years has been, Oh, can you squeeze me in at, you know, six o'clock for a haircut? Right, right. So, you know, doing these things that are, you know, that other people may take for granted, uh, it's been wonderful. So that's a recent change in my schedule the past few months, but I don't think I can go back now. <laughs> yeah. So so then the four days you do work are a little bit longer, let's say like four, 10 hour days yes. versus five, eight hour days? Exactly. Probably exactly. makes a lot more sense that way too. 
Yeah, I think it's efficiency, right? <laughs> yeah. But the other thing you mentioned, too, which was super critical, I don't know if everyone picked it up, was how it's evolved. So you're, you're, the way you work and the way your practice is and the way your career is, is always going to keep evolving from year to year. And so the way you start off that first year or two or three out of training is not what it's going to be forever. So being open to like change and evolving it and changing it to what suits your needs. Right. I mean, there's this, you know, shift in mentality. After training, we're so used to putting our head down and just pushing through. Sure. And not really asking questions about whether, am I happy with this setup? Do I want to do something more? Do I want to do something less? We're just used to grinding for, you know, lack of a better word. And now we finally have the choice to shape our life the way that we want it to be. And as a matter of fact, I encourage everyone to do that because it's not about the next step anymore once you're finished mm-hmm. training. Yeah. Right? There's no... There's no next you know, step. We're used to these... There's, yes, we're used to, oh, just get through residency. Okay, just get through fellowship. Okay, just get through the first year. At some point, we have to shift and think, like, this is the moment now. And we actually have to start, you know, shaping our life the way we want it to be. Yeah, no, that's a super important point. That's a super... Now, one of the things that I said when I was... Uh, one of the stupidest things I said... When I was a senior resident, I told myself, oh, I can't wait till my practice will be so much easier. Right. And the joke is that, it's, of course, it's not. And so then one of the, the sayings I had during residency, and I taught residents for 22 years, stopping last year, only retiring last year, was I tell residents, yes, I understand you think residency is difficult, but it's difficult the same way that 11th grade was difficult at the time. But now when you right. look back, 11th grade is a walk in the park, and I assure you, residency is also a walk in the park. Does that still hold true now, 20 years later for you? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I wish I had more complications before. I mean, of course, you know, everyone does in residency, but now you realize, actually, you wish you had complications, more of them when people were watching. Yeah. And assisting. And would guide you. Saving you. To saving you. You know, I mean, there's been moments when you're in the eye and you're in surgery and you're like, I actually can't run and hide. I actually have to just push through <laughs> and figure this out, you know? Right. And, um, and I, I think that's absolutely true. And if, you, if you're expecting for, uh, you know, life to be magically so much easier, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. Sure. sure you sure, know, sure. And, and one of uh, my mentors at Hopkins actually told me this. It's very true. I, I don't think it's, it's good to say one year or two years. I think it takes a solid three years at least. Yeah. To start feeling comfortable. It's not a uh-huh. one year thing. It takes several years. And even, you know, now I'm three and a half years. I'm still learning all the time. Gosh, I hate to tell you, I'm 23 years out of residency. I still learn every month. Every month, it's exactly. like, whoa, I did, I did not realize that. Right. And that's what makes it so fun. You know, for sure, for sure. There are a lot of challenges there. Now, I'll tell you a, a story about work-life balance that'll... I got a couple stories. The first one is, obviously, I made lots of mistakes. And one of the things, my wake-up moment that I made a huge mistake was, I one day got a letter. I think 15 years ago, I was a consultant for all these companies. I would travel the world all the time. And I got a letter from one of these hotel chains that says, hey, congrats, you're a diamond status member because you stayed 68 nights in our hotels last year. And I just sunk my head into my hands and thought, oh my gosh, I'm so stupid. How did I spend two months of my life last year in this company's hotels? And I have another friend here in LA. She's one of these big surgeons, like those big abdominal and, and whatever surgeries. And she says, you know, she had not taken her daughter to the pediatrician appointments, the well baby checks and all that. She says, you know, I'm going to be a good mom. I'm going to take my little girl, Molly, to the pediatrician this time. So she takes Molly over there and she wants to like, and Molly's like three years old. And, and the pediatrician says, okay, Molly, open your mouth. And she does nothing. And he says, again, yeah, like, open your mouth. He says to the mom, does Molly, is she okay? She developed me delayed. And she's like, no, here. And she tells this blonde haired boy baby, Molly, abre la boca. Ah. And she does it. And the doctor's like, oh, your baby only speaks Spanish? She's like, yeah, because I've been working so hard. She's with the nanny basically all the time. And my kid only speaks Spanish. And that was her wake up moment. Now, did you have to have a wake up moment? Or you were smarter than us? You, you figured it out from the get go. You know, I've had. I've, no, I was not. And I'm, and I'm still learning. I've had also the opposite problem where, you know, sometimes I'll pick up my kids. I usually don't pick them up or drop them off. To be honest, I'm very blessed that I do have help because usually the daycare, I mean, it'll be what, nine to two. 
Mm. You know, I'm already 10 patients deep and I'm nowhere near being done yeah. by 2 p.m. So sometimes when they see me, they'll say, oh, you know, who are you again? <laughs> so then I feel so embarrassed, mm. you know, I'm like, oh, gosh, you know, I have those shameful moments yeah. where I wonder, you know, I, should I be more present? Should I, am I doing a good job? And I think just taking a day out of a t- at a time. And making sure every day, for us, it, every day we have a moment where we all come together. And for us, that sacred time is 6.45. So at oh. 6.45 p.m., wherever we are, you know, we try to resume home by then. And that's when our dinner time is. And um, unless there's some event going on where someone has to be gone, we're, we're always there. And that's our time. From then until bedtime, we're always together. And then weekends, we're always together. And then I'm constantly in communication with the people who are involved in our child care about, you know, what's going on. I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old. That's, so a, lot, that's pretty... a lot of work. Oh, my gosh. That is so much work. And so, so much work. And they're always changing. Right. Right. You know, and then the school's calling me. I mean, my son, for example, every day he's like running into something, falling down. There's something always going on with them that's different that you actually, right when you think that you've reached status quo, okay, something changes Mm -hmm. with them. And anyone who's a parent of, you know, an infant or toddler knows, you know, just when you think you got it down, okay, they start crawling. Then you got it down, (laughs) then they start walking. Then they got it down. There's always a new discovery and you always have to be on your toes and ready for change. Right. Well, it's it's refreshing. But so I guess we all kind of, you know, learn a little bit by mistake, by seeing what works. But I love your family time. It's one of those things that I kind of wish you, I didn't have that as a kid. I wish I did. And I made the mistake of not being so good about that with my kids of, yeah, every night we're all having a family dinner. There's something magical about that. There is. I never had it like that, but we, I think it's really important. And then also no phones. Right? Oh, wow. So our phones are always blowing out, like emails, texts, everything. No phones at the dinner table. <laughs> oh, I like that. I do that now. When I go to a restaurant with some friends or family, I leave the phone in the car. Yeah, I don't want to be bothered. That's wonderful. I mean, nothing is that much of an emergency. Unless we're on call, yeah. there's no need to have the phone at the dinner table. And I think it's showing them good habits because I know for my kids, they don't use much electronics or we try not to. And if I'm always on my phone, well, that's kind of hypocritical, right? Right. And they're watching everything we do. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's a new generation. Honestly, I don't know even the challenges that are ahead. But, you know, this whole social media and electronics and how to teach them a healthy balance of it. Well, we have to be the role models for that. And so I wish, Uday, that I I had an answer of the perfect way to do it, but I don't, and I'm just learning. But I hope, if anything, that everyone can hear that. And that's okay to not know. Just try your best. Learn lessons from other people. Everything that I do, I've kind of kind of gotten advice from friends or family members or mentors about how they've done it. Sure. And then I apply that to my own life. So trial and error is okay. I think we all basically do that method. Absolutely. So how did you navigate having, gosh, the pregnancy and a newborn with your, because I mean, if you think about your career, your most productive years generally for these careers are, you know, 30-ish plus or minus, maybe 40s. How do you squeeze that in there? How did you, did you, how did you plan for this or just kind of take it as it comes? No, you're absolutely right. So I'll never forget, I was in my maybe mid-20s. And as an ACPEC at Wilmer, she was one of my mentors when I was in medical school. And she said, Priya, you know, she always is completely blunt and honest. And she says, Priya, you know, we're expected to be the most productive, both academically and biologically and in every way, like in your late 20s and 30s, that's really when your life is coming together and propelling forward. And I'll never forget that. I mean, it was over 10 years ago, but I realized it is all at once, like no more delayed gratification. I can't say okay, I'm going to do all these things for school. And then I'm going to do this. Life doesn't work in a timeline. Yeah. And you just kind of have to go with how it is. So, you know, I think that now there's more awareness about, you know, parenting, about infertility, you know, within medicine especially. And there are some really tough statistics. For example, what I've heard is one in four female physicians have 
you know, experienced some kind of difficulty in getting pregnant. But I think that number is much higher, probably even closer to 50%. And that's looming over a lot of our young female doctors. And that's stressful. You know, you're trying to... You're trying to make it through training, you know, may have met the right person, may not have, in whatever situation you're in, you know, you have this, you have this stress that, you know, I'm taking care of other people. I'm trying to do something that I'm so passionate about, but at the same time, am, is it coming at a cost of my own future family life? Sure. Yeah, and, and that's I think so that's true. Tough. It's tough and I don't have the right answer. I think there's more awareness, which is the first step. And I, I hope that it will continue to improve throughout the years, you know, making it easier for parents who are residents. I mean, I don't know if you were a parent when you were a resident. I wasn't. And I, now I think back of the parents that I knew that were residents. Mm-hmm. I'm like, how did they do it? No, no, for sure. I mean, if you add up the years too, four years of college, if no gap year, then four years of med school, that's eight. Four more ophthalmology. That's 12. You did an MPH, there's 13. You did another fellowship, there's 14. You're like, oh my gosh, the years just add up. Just five up. Before you know, I'm at the end of fellowship. I'm 32 year, years old. It's not necessarily that I was like, oh, I want a baby tomorrow. But I knew, I mean, I'm 32. You know, the longer you wait, probably statistically, the harder it's going yeah. to be. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I think that's, that's, that's a stress that women don't talk about, to be perfectly sure. honest. I mean, we, we talk about it behind closed doors, but... It is, it's certainly present. And I think that we should talk about it and uh, support one another. And, and same with men. I mean, I have a perfect case control study because my husband, Joaquin, does the exact same thing that I do. Sure. Right. But, you know, he was fortunate. I could kind of see, you know, in his brain, he didn't have to think about that as much as I did. And he's lucky in that way, right? <laughs> and, yeah, well, and, you, uh, you had the baby. He fathered a baby. There's a difference. <laughs> right. right. Both are very important. But, you know, we thought, you know, might as well. Any time is as good as now. So um, I, I had a baby with four months after starting my first job. Wow. And so even it, it was vi- now that I look back at it, I, I kind of think it's funny, but it was very, I was so nervous to tell my first boss that I was pregnant and he was the nicest, nicest person ever, you know, but you, you kind of worry, are people going to think that I'm not as serious about my career or that mm. I'm not going to come back? And, and there's just this fear of, you know, what are people going to think? But the truth is you have to do what's best for you. Yeah. And, sure. um, yeah. And, and, and you have to think about what you, do you want to be a parent? And parenting may not be for everyone, you know, for those people who want to be parents, you know, you have to live your life and you have to, you have to do what the timeline that works for you. And I think that how you plan it and, um, it is very important. So for example, what, once I found I was pregnant, I kind of had a plan of how I was going to do it. Okay. Hopefully I'm going to be out for X amount of weeks. How am I going to communicate with everyone mm-hmm. that, you know, I will be gone during this time? And I think it's really important to first tell whoever is in charge. You want them to hear from you. You don't want them to find out from someone else. Sure. And uh, I think that's, that's very, very important to do it in a way that's respectful to the person who, to your employer, whether it's a chair of a department or if it's a head of your practice, and then formulate a, an organized plan. Hey, I'm going to be gone, but I'm committed. I still, I love my job. I'm coming back. This is how I'm going to handle it. And then I think everyone would be happy for you in that situation. Yeah, the tough part too for you also is you don't just do a job and then, okay, raising my family, but you also take on other roles. Key opinion leader, I've seen you on the podium in many meetings now. You're doing consulting work with a lot of our family companies. You talked about you have your nonprofit you're starting. I see your name on articles now in, in, in some of the trade journals. So I'm like, you're doing some research, maybe involves some clinical trials. Wow, you've got a lot of plates spinning at once. It feels like a lot. And organization is key. There, and, and also, you know, sharing with your partner and leaning on them and you, it, having a supportive person by your side is so important because mm-hmm. it won't work otherwise. And so we... we stumbled a lot and we've and now our kids are at the age where when we both are gone 
they're sad and they're asking, oh, why are good. you both gone? And that makes it harder, you know? And so yeah. we try to take turns. Okay, you have a talk tonight, so then I'm going to do another night. And so at least if one of us is home, we've noticed that the kids are, it's kind of easier for them because we don't want them to feel neglected either, right? They're, they're so precious. So uh, we trade off and then a lot happens the moment that the kids go to sleep. And I think a lot of parents can say that as soon as the kids are asleep, okay, well, that's an hour or two hours of your own that you can be at the computer and get work done. Sure. And um, on the weekends, you know, if they still nap, once they nap, it's like a, a, t- a timer goes off and we both are like, <laughs> okay, no one talk. Everyone get their work done. And keep it quiet. And so, <laughs> keep it quiet. Keep it quiet. And that's, you bring up another good point too. You know, I, in the beginning, especially since I started my practice and had, you know, two babies within 20 months, Wow. Uh, a lot happened at once and I had to pass up on some opportunities, which was hard for me because I actually love working with industry and spreading what I've learned and sure. that I'm just a social person. I like doing that. And I kind of felt, well, if I give up this opportunity, am I going to have the chance to do this again? Mm-hmm. And the truth is you will. Yes. You, you, you yeah, will. There's sure. no, you always people are looking for, you know, doctors who want to share their knowledge, whether it's about the medical aspect or the surgical aspect and, um, and people who are nice and friendly and passionate about what they do. So you will have the opportunity. Yeah. And if your kids are in an age where you can't leave, I didn't go to Academy for the past two years. And, and that was hard for me because I, I love going and seeing all my friends, but you know, one year I was pregnant, the next year I had a newborn and, and, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. It, you won't be able to do it all. And that is okay. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you bring that up. Uh, when I got that letter about, you know, the diamond status for the hotel, I felt so guilty that I decided that I probably should just pull back from meetings for a while. And so I sought the advice of someone I really respect at the time, which is Dick Lindstrom. And Dick Lindstrom, he says, he says, he says don't worry. Take care, prioritize your family, enjoy the time with your kids. Ophthalmology will still be here. Yeah. And so he, it sounds crazy, it sounds so obvious, but... I, he's right. I took a few years of no meetings. Anytime there's an academy or ASCRS, I did a trip with the family instead of going to the meeting. And then it kind of culminated with, I, at one time, my kids were maybe like middle school age. We went to Europe for 33 days straight. And those were memories wow. that I'll always love. And guess what? When my kids went off to college and both kids did you know, East Coast stuff now, East Coast schools, ophthalmology's still here. So some people say, oh, you just burst on the scene with cataract coach. Oh, uh, no, I've been doing this stuff for more than 20 years. It's just that, you know, when my kids were of that age of high school, junior high and high school, I just didn't, I wanted to prioritize them. And I'm so glad I did, because now as an empty nester, I got nothing but time. Right. So, right. yeah, enjoy the and time with your kids. Miss- Ophthalmology will always be there. We'll always be there. And there's so many first moments that we miss. Like, mm-hmm. I wasn't there for their first steps. You know, I wasn't there for the first time they start talking. And so the little that you can be there for with, like these weekends, these vacations, they're sure. so precious. Yeah, for sure. And it doesn't have to be the quantity of time, but it's the quality. I really do believe that. Oh, for you sure. You know, when you're there yeah. with them, all in. Yeah, that's so, that's so important. Now, how do you manage a, let's say there's a meeting coming up. Like, I know I'll see you and Joaquin in two weeks at the ACOS meeting in Deer Valley. Fantastic meeting. Yes. Well, yes. How do, you, how do you manage the time away from the kids during that? Or do you bring the kids? It's tough. It's tough. So we kind of have split it. You know, there are certain meetings, ACOS being one of them, only because they're so young right now that we have not been taking them. But we try not to leave the kids more than twice a year. Everything else we either split, we either only one of us goes, or we take them with us. Oh, you go. And my hope is as they get older, we can take them more. Like, I didn't really want to be on a plane for five hours with a two year old boy, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> we're not taking them to Deer Park, but I can imagine once they're a little bit early, older and potty trained. You know, they're going to want to come with us. We've taken them to Kiowa. We're going to Women in Ophthalmology in August. Um, we've taken them to several meetings with us. And uh, we usually take a, someone to help if we can, either a family member, like a grandparent or a nanny. 
that can help us only because we both are often gone at the same time. Sure. And, and that's been really fun because we're sharing these fun experiences together yeah. and, and they get to be a part of it. And my hope is that they'll be able to see, wow, mom and dad are so fulfilled by what they do and whatever they decide to do, you know, I just hope they find a career that they're that fulfilled and happy with, that they want to spend their free time with those people. Yeah, that, make, that makes a ton of sense. That's actually, yeah, it's a very smart way to do it. But with that said, watch, both your kids are going to do retina. <laughs> right. Oh, no, anything but that. No, I'm kidding. But then, and then when we're gone for meetings, sure. you know, we, um, we kind of, uh, I, this is the system that works for us, but the grandparents are always involved, but, you know, our, the grandparents are in their 70s. And yeah. it's, it's hard to chase around a one-year-old and a three-year-old all the time. So we usually, I, I set up a schedule where I have two or three people involved, you know, watching from these hours to these hours. But then there's a grandparent that's kind of around and has an extra pair of hands. Oh, that's um, helpful. Which, which helps us feel a little bit more comfortable and, and the kids to know like grandma or grandpa is, is around. And then the babysitter also has an extra pair of hands. But we try not to be gone more than, I mean, it's tough. Like 40, even 48 hours, it's such an ordeal to get both of us out the house for 48 hours. Yeah, but we do right. it. And I, and I think it's, it, it's, it's healthy, too. Yeah, for sure. And the technology helps, too, now that you can do FaceTime. I mean, when my kids were that age, there was obviously no FaceTime, so it was a different world. But now, even my daughter, who's in med school on the East Coast, I, it's just so fun. I get to FaceTime her. I'm usually bothering her, and she's like, Dad, I'm busy. But... <laughs> Still, I get to see her face and interact with her, so it, it feels a lot more real. But I, I think right. yeah, just maximize those things. And like you said, I think the key is that quality time. When you're with them, put the phones away. You're not doing anything else. You're not checking emails. Let's just do that absolute family, the bonding time. That's probably more important than, you know, longer hours where you're sitting there in the same room with them as you're playing on your iPad and they're watching TV. Exactly. I think that's very important. And adventures and we're just having so much fun because, you know, they, they're at a really fun age right now. And the things that they're saying and the things that they want to do, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun for us. So it's a break actually. And for me, I feel like parenting has brought out a better side of me being a doctor. Sure. You know, it, it's it made me more well-rounded and I take care of a lot of keratoconus patients, for example, too. And as a parent now, I, I, I look at kids differently. Yeah. I'm like, what if that was my kid? No, I, to- I, I, to- I totally get that. So it, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. But, you know, definitely it takes a village. And I think going back on the child care, you know, on our, kind of our daily routine, I think it's important to have help. Sure. And, you know, we're just so used to, as doctors, doing everything ourselves and having full control. But you can actually you know, find people who are committed to helping you with your children. And it's not easy. And I think that everyone, no matter what city you live in, we know that it's hard to find very good nannies and uh, who are trustworthy and committed and love your kids and will even tell them right from wrong. It's not easy. But if you treat them like family and you really Mm -hmm. take them in, I mean, our nannies, they're they're a part of our family, you know? Uh, and the kids love them, and that's what you want. You know, for, uh, you're a hundred percent right. If you treat the nannies or, or your or your, your your team as as family, they treat your yes. kids as family. So it, it it goes, it trickles down. It trickles down, and I think there's a lot of parallels to yeah. running a team at work and also running a household. Yeah, tell right? me, tell me, tell me more about that. I, I think that r- recognition and appreciation is so important. Yeah. With our team members, you know, hey, I noticed the extra time that you took with Mrs. Jones. I really appreciate that. I appreciate you taking that extra mile, going that extra mile and, you know, doing X, Y, and Z. Uh, with the nannies, you know, hey, I noticed that you didn't have to do this. I didn't ask you to, you know, organize all the drawers mm-hmm. without me saying it, but you did that. And that means a lot to me because I didn't have time to do that. So thank you for doing that. And I think that people want to be valued and appreciated. It's so simple, right? Yeah, no, for sure. But it goes a long way. Now, when you went from your fellowship, and most fellowships in the U.S., or even, you did a great fellowship, but it's a fraction of the volume you do in practice now. How do you ramp that up? How do you prepare yourself mentally 
to get more cases done to, while no one is sitting next to you to bail you out of a tough case or advise you? It's hard. It's certainly, certainly hard. And, and you want, I think one thing that's important from the beginning, if I could give one advice, is operating as much as you can. At least I knew with my personality, if I didn't operate that much from the beginning, I thought that, I really believe that I would have lost confidence. Yeah. But if, you're, if, you, if you really just take all the volume that comes in, take those hard cases. You know, someone has to do it. Right. Do the, you know, take those traumatic cataracts, take those transplants that no one wants to do. So I kind of just took everything that came my way. And, um, you know, I remember w- w- one person saying to this to me, and it's so true. If you take all the complicated cases and people start trusting you to do the tough ones, then they're going to say, oh, well, obviously they can handle the easy ones. That's, right? a, gr- that's a great point. But that's one of my pearls. For a young ophthalmologist, if you want to get busy, you ask the referring doctor, just send me your really tough cases. That's exactly what I did. Yeah. So send me anything. You know, t- give me those 5 p.m. Friday ulcers, you know, and then, oh, by the way, I do cataract surgery. I do all this stuff, you know. But, you know, give me anything. And, and that's how you learn. And the, I, I just learned the, the learning is just, it, it's, it's just exponential the first one, two, three years. And, and you continue to learn, of course, but it's exponential in the beginning. And if you dive into your patients and those surgeries, you know, really try your Mm -hmm. best. And for the first over a year, actually when I did more complex cases or tough transplants, I would actually print out step-by-step what to do and tape it on my microscope. And I'm not ashamed to say it. I love it. You know, it was a security blanket to me. And I, I know, I mean, sometimes the scrub techs would look at me like, I mean, how much... Does this doctor know she has to tape the steps for surgery, you know, but there's just some comfort in knowing, you know, I may not have a person next to me, but if I'm nervous, I can just look there and say, okay, I did step one, two, three, four. And in my mind, just say, okay, I did all of these steps. Right. Right. And, and and I also, um, during fellowship, I, I tell everyone in training this write down all of your pearls that you're learning, you know, about, Mm -hmm. about tough Mm -hmm. transplants, tough cataracts, write it down. And I use Google doc, which I like because I was able to continuously edit it. Um, you know, Oh, I learned this time to do this for a PK. Okay. The next time I did it, I learned something else. So you wouldn't have to, if you write it all in a book, it's hard to stay organized, Sure. but if you do it in a dynamic document, then you can keep adding it. And so those documents, I still look at that. For cases yeah. that I don't do that often, I still look at my notes and I watch videos, my own videos all the time. And then I also recorded my attendings operating. Sure. And that helped me a- as well a lot. And, you know, not only was it hard to ramp up in the beginning, very stressful, you know, uh, but also every time I went on maternity leave, it was two times, I felt like I took 10 steps back. Yeah, you, you feel know? a little rusty when you come back feel rusty yeah. and and no one really talks about that but and, it's true. And, and it's hard yeah it's true I can <laughs> take, yeah you can take a month off and you come back like oh it just takes me a, at least a few cases to right. get, get back in the groove right and a lot of the women were laughing because remember during COVID a lot of our male colleagues were like oh no we paused surgery for a month or two what are we gonna do <laughs> And the women are like, you do realize we've been doing this since the beginning of the time, every time we have a baby, right? <laughs> and yeah. we just have to come right back into it yeah. and, 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 and jump back into surgery. And so I think that preparing is very important. I did learn a lot along the way. The first time after I um, had my first kid, I came back five weeks afterwards. Wow, that's and fast. And this was... It was fast and it was self-inflicted. You know, yeah. no one told me to come back that early. But there was this feeling like, oh, my patients are there. Oh, I want to go back to yeah. work. And there's almost this feeling of it can't be that bad. <laughs> right? It can't be that tough. But I learned and I was humbled. Yeah, and, no, for sure. you know, having a, a, a new baby, you think you go through residency and fellowship, but there's no post-call day. Right. There's not that you don't have that 24 hours to recover. Mm-hmm. You just, you just keep going and, um, and, and you have to recover yourself and take care of this tiny human being. And, and it's a lot. And 
a lot of the listeners I, I, I know already know all of this, but if I could say one thing, it's give yourself grace, give yourself more time than you need if you can, you know, everyone's sure. situation is different. And then in the beginning, maybe if you can do part time for even a week or two weeks, even doing three days a week, that really to ease helps. back into it. To ease back even a one week, that mm-hmm. would help to figure out, okay, what am I doing for childcare? If you're pumping, where am I going to pump? I mean, medicine is behind. It's a fact of the matter. My friends in finance, there's a pumping room on every floor, right? There's a, you know, there, there's a lot more awareness of what, the help that uh, a new mom needs and, and making accommodations for it. And I think that's really important um, to, to, to recognize that. So, I, you know, I, had a, I shared an office with a bunch of people. I would go to my car to pump. Oh, wow. <laughs> for several months. You know, in the surgery center, there's no room. There's a big locker room. And, and that's, my story is not unique. Sure. There are thousands, you know, of women that have done the same thing. But, and I was too nervous to even ask for something more, you know. And I think that that's important. Figure out what you're going to do and don't be afraid to ask, where can I have a room to pump to feed my baby? That's yeah, okay. For sure. For sure. And in the same way, you know, this kind of reminds me, I tell all young women, ask about maternity leave. And that's a regret I have. I never did. And I think that's really important. Even if it may not have changed, you know, whether I did get paid maternity leave or how long it was for, but still at least ask for it. Yeah. And, and in medicine, we have to start asking for, you know, some kind of maternity leave. And just see, I'm, I'm talking about women, but also men, maybe, you know, there are a lot of men that want to stay home for even one week or two weeks. It's okay to want to be there with your kids the first few weeks that they're yeah. home. That's okay. And I think that there's this assumption that, oh, the men can go straight back to work. Well, is that fair? You know? Well, it, it, when I was a resident, my daughter was born on a, on a Wednesday afternoon. I, they, gave, <laughs> they gave me the afternoon off. And then yeah. Thursday morning, I was back at the, in, the, in the operating room of the clinic at 6 a.m. It was just, uh, of course. It's a little while. Yeah, I think there needs to be change. I think you're right. I think uh, residency programs may be doing a better job of this than, than practices, you know. Um, and so if you are a resident, my daughter was born when I was a senior resident. Son was born shortly thereafter. I think it's a great thing. It's, a, it's fun to be, a, you know, a younger parent too. And now that my kids are older, I can still keep up with my son in weightlifting. So I'm not falling too far behind. <laughs> so. Right. Well, going, going back, one thing you were talking about, about the, the surgical skills, which is super important, is how you are still learning from every case. And we talked about this on Catacoach, the, the learning curve. So when you finish yes. your residency or fellowship, let's say you think, okay, I did 300 cases. I'm really good. I mean, I hate to tell you that 300 is not even halfway up the learning curve. In my estimation, 500 to 1,000 is about halfway up the learning curve. And by maybe 2,000 cases, you're probably 80, 90% of the way there. So as you write, you do taper off on the learning. It's diminishing returns after 10,000 uh, 10, cases. But that first 1,000 cases is no joke. There's so much learning. So much. And I think you're exactly right. I remember listening to your videos and hearing that. About 1,000 cases. You're, right. I think you're right. To get, the, get you halfway there, I, I couldn't agree more because there's just so much to learn and seeing your patients post-op and, right. okay, I did this new technique. How do they look the next day? Trying different lenses. You know, yeah. I'll never forget the first time, you know, I started putting in multifocal lenses, mm-hmm. like crossing my fingers, you know, seeing them the next day. And that's something that I always tell young, um, young surgeons. And I have a lot of people who text me, okay, what lens would you put in? I know how it feels like, you know, to be nervous sure. about, you know, doing this because it's not like you get that much exposure to it in residency. Maybe if you go to a, a pri- one of the private practice fellowships, you get a lot of exposure, but otherwise not really. Yeah. And, and you learn it on the job. And that's an important thing, too. You know, if you look back when I was a, a resident, there was no OCT imaging. There was no anti-VEGF. There was no femtosecond laser. There was no lamellar transplant. None of this existed. So you got to learn it yourself. So I'll give you my own, uh, you know, uh, um, list here. I made a list of the steps for DMEC. And I watched Peter, yeah. Peter Veldman's videos, like, countless, countless, countless times. And I made a list to put on my microscope too. There's my confession. So I was like, I'm not gonna forget that inferior PI. 
I'm not gonna forget that he likes 16%, whatever it was, you know, for his gas. So I'm like, I made a note of everything and I put it on my scope too. And I learned that when I was like 48 years old. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It really works though. Right. right. Having that list. Another thing is I had the steps for anterior vitrectomy in my notebook that I always brought to the OR. Yeah. Because I knew what if that moment I just freeze. Yeah. You just I wanted to remember. And I actually review I, for the first two years, I would say every OR day, I reviewed all the steps for anterior vitrectomy. Oh, nice. And I, I know it's, but that was, I, I'm more of a, probably more on the ner- nervous side, especially in the first few years, but I really did um, review it and I, I felt more confident. Okay. I, it's fresh in my mind. Yeah. If sure. anything happens, I'm prepared. For sure. And one of my mentors, Dr. Jim Orrin, he always says this. He's like, you know, if, if something goes badly in surgery, just make it seem like you, you meant to do it. Take a pause. And he was the best, he was the best teacher. You know, if anything happened, he'd be like, that is the best anterior vitrectomy I've ever seen. <laughs> you know, he made you feel like a million bucks. And so I, it will happen. And I think you do a great job of, um, of saying that to your listeners, Uday. I really sure. have to say that complications will happen. Right. It's part of surgery and that's okay. And think of all those patients that you were taking care of you know, that, that did great. Of course. We tend to only remember the ones that, you know, everything may not have gone perfectly and we can't always blame ourselves either. Right. Any, any pearls for like compartmentalizing? Let's say like an example you brought up. You have a case, there's a complication. You're just, if you're like me, you're just, it just, it's playing over in your head over and over and over again. Yes. How do you move on to like, oh, you still have 12 more cases to go. How do you move on to the next case? What's your way of kind of, Getting back on the that horse. That is a great question. So um, that's one of the hardest things. And even now I struggle with that. If there, like, Or something was just even harder. Let's just say there was no complications. I, that always happens to me with transplants because I put them on er, earlier in the day because they have to lay flat. And so let's say, you know, last week I had a very tra- tough one. The patient had tubes and traps. And any air I put in the, in the eye is just going out of yeah. the eye, you know? And it's frustrating. And finally you get it, and then still you're thinking about it three cases later. The way I kind of mentally tell myself is is that the patient on the table, that's the next patient, they owe, they they deserve 100% of my mental, you know, thought and and energy. Yes. It's not fair to them if I'm thinking about something else, right? right? Mm -hmm. And I have to do it for the patient who's there. Otherwise, you know, I, I have to. And so... I, I've just kind of learned with time, like this is a, I, I'm pretty intense, you know, our surgery, um, our OR goes pretty, moves pretty fast. And so, you know, you just got to go in, you're, you're, you're in a game, it's intense and, and you have to put all of your focus on that next patient and just kind of block it from your mind, you know? And then afterwards you can think about it and, and want to hide it in your bed and, you know, whatever you need to do. But um, I think that is really a, a good point that you bring up. Also, after every surgery day, my secret is that I go to yoga after every surgery day. Nice. And it's my favorite thing to do. And I go to hot yoga. Okay. And I, it's just so intense that I, you, I, it just takes all the stresses off my mind. Because otherwise, I'm just like replaying surgery in my yeah, mind yeah, over yeah. and over again. Sure. So I drive straight from surgery to yoga and then I sweat it out, and then I come out as a different person, and oh, that's and important. that's like my reward after surgery, and I, I I love it. Mine is bench press day after after OR day. <laughs> that afternoon is bench press day. So no, I, you got to have a way of getting the stress. So that's for sure. The other thing too with with the compartmentalizing, it's not just that day, but remember we, we all have personal lives which are often crazy. We've got business things going on, financial worries. We've got our parents to worry about, our friends' issues, our and all kinds of things. I got that leak at, at home with the drain and the. You, when you, but when you're doing that surgery, you compartmentalize all that out because it's just 100% of your bandwidth is you right. and that patient and right here and that right now in that surgery. That's it. Right. And actually, one thing this brings me up to another point exercise is a huge part of my life. Like, yeah, I, I try to go four or five times a week, almost every day. And um, the past year, I've been doing this boot camp type of classes. 
cool. these high intensity interval training. And I found that really helps me in the OR because the stamina and I'm just like, go, go, go next, next, next. Yeah, yeah. And, and that just the performance, I feel like, um, I don't get as tired, you know? And so I think it's good, important to be in good physical shape because that's also translates to your mind and your body and your stamina and how many hours you can do surgery, you know, and it's all connected. We need the best version of ourselves in the OR. And that brings another point is sleeping the night before surgery when you have young kids. Oh, for sure. Now, what's your pro? It's easy for me. I get a solid eight hours before every surgical day, for sure, for sure. But it's it's easy for me. But how, how do you accomplish that? It is hard. So we take turns. So whoever has, since we both operate, whoever's OR day it is the next day, that person is off baby duty. You know, 8 p.m., you're done. You, where no one's going to ask anything. You can go to sleep. You can do whatever you need to do. But I think it's really important that the night before surgery, you try to get the best possible sleep you can. And that it might involve, you know, either relying on your significant other or maybe a, a parent or a friend, sure. but I think sleeping well the night before surgery is so important. Yeah, I know for sure. For sure, for sure. And I have my own uh, regimen the night before surgery just to kind of wind down and like, I actually go through, I, I look at the list for the, the, the following day surgery and like, oh, there's a couple tough ones. And as I'm putting my head on the pillow, I'm thinking like, all right, how am I gonna do that case? What am I gonna do for this one? I kind of, I kind of play them in my head. Right. Right. And, you know, I also order, I mean, usually I don't mind whatever order the cataracts are, but if there's tough ones, you know, dealing about when you discussed about possible complications, I always put them at the end. Me too. Yeah. You know, if you're anticipating a patient to be tough, put them at the end of the day. You know, we always um, have these initials EOS, end of schedule. And, and sometimes if it's really bad, it's a, I put TLC and that means the last case. <laughs> <laughs> and so my scheduler knows how to put it that way. And that way you can put your, your entire energy into it, yeah. not worry about what cases are after that. Right. Sometimes that I'll helps. do too is I'll book them as two spots. So I'm like in yes. my lineup of his cases, like, that's a really tough case. I may have to do SICS. All right, let's just book that as two cases. I'll almost always finish before. And then I have like right. a nice little bit of a break and like, okay, before the next one's ready. So Right. Get, yeah, no, and that takes time to plan this out and figure this out. That uh, obviously is, goes with uh, when you get, get in your practice and you start evolving it over time. Now, where do you think you're going right. to evolve your practice to in the future? Are you going to do more surgical? Are you going to do more corny? Where do you think you'll end up evolving it? You know, I've, at, I've been asked this question a lot. Right now, I have a huge variety. So I'm doing a lot of cataract surgery, a lot of cornea, and, and some LASIK too. I actually enjoy all the different aspects. So sure. right now, my division, I, I'm perfectly happy with it. Sure. So I see myself continuing to do everything. You know, a lot of people said, oh, well, to be more efficient, maybe you should give up something. But I like the variety. Yeah. You know, I, like I, I don't I mind. That. Yeah. I like seeing an ICL patient. I saw, you know, who's 2010. And then I like walking into an ulcer that looks terrible, sure. you know, and, 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 and figuring out what's going on. There's a different type of satisfaction and reward that comes from both of those types of patients. Yeah. So you know, yeah. I, I love it. So at this point, you're doing the full spectrum. You don't, don't take it off. That's, that's great. Yeah. And, and it's a lot of fun. I continue to learn. And I think that, and like, like we were talking about, we continue to evolve and decide, okay, do I want to keep doing this or do I want to give it up? But one thing I think is important is you, in the beginning, try to do as much as you can. Let's say you learn LASIK and fellowship. And then you don't do it for some time. It is a little bit harder. It's not impossible. You can definitely learn it afterwards. But sure. if you think you're going to want to do it, try to fight to do it from the beginning. Sure. Of because that will allow you to apply those skills and, 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 uh, and keep getting better. No, that's, that's for sure. Another thing, question that people always ask me, a lot of young ophthalmologists say, well, how do I get involved in the key opinion leader stuff? I'm speaking on the podium and... And, you know, basically consulting with the companies. I had a podcast recently with another young cornea specialist, Nandini Venkateshwaran, who's, oh, who's, yeah. who, she's amazing too. But amazing. How, how do you get involved when you're this young and you, you, unlike me, you've got no gray hair and you're coming there and you're like, okay, here's how I can help you. How do you get involved with all this stuff? Right. So that's a great question. I actually had a call with Neda Shami two years ago. I'll never forget um, asking her that same question. I'm like, you know, I see you and you're like involved in all this industry and how do you do it? You know, and her advice was 
you know, volunteer yourself for w- what you're passionate about. Yeah. You may notice a pattern. Start out that way. You know, if you notice a product or whether it's a medicine, you know, it's maybe a dry eye medication or uh, an IOL that you, you are passionate about, you believe it works, go to the company and say, hey, I believe in your technology and I'm willing to speak for you. And, uh, and that's exactly what I did. And also I'll add another really important piece of advice S and ACPEC told me, which, uh, you know, she was always very honest about before you do any kind of consulting and speaking, you actually need to know what you're talking about. Yeah. Right? yeah. She, she, oh, it's so true. You know, you first have to be a master of your craft you got, and there's no way to learn until you see a lot of patients and do a lot of surgery. Yeah. There's no other way of learning. Sure. You can read everything in books, but until you see it firsthand, until you see how's the medication working on this patient, mm-hmm. do I understand how it works? Right. Okay, what are my outcomes with this IOL? What is a patient telling me the next day? Until you're doing that, you really aren't in the position yet to kind of you know do consulting or speaking. And once you get there, well then... Offer yourself, and that's exactly what I did. So I started with one of the dry eye medications I know that I noticed worked well. And that was my first consulting opportunity. And I said, yeah, you know, I, I think this medication works differently. And and that come, one thing led to another thing. And I'm sure. sure, as you know, you know, and then with IOL, same. I'm like, you know, this 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 lens works really, really well. I believe in it. I'm getting really good results. I'm willing to speak for you. And I think that companies are looking for mm-hmm. younger surgeons now. Oh, that absolutely. I can't tell you the number of companies who say, "Please, how do you we need more young key opinion leaders?" Right. And 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 they're willing to. And for men and women, they they want a diverse group of people to give their experiences from all over the United States. And so it's there's been a ship and there's certainly a value in what you have to say and it's a strange feeling to, you know, we're so used to learning from other people. Well, now you have something valuable to say, sure. right? And we, sure. we all do after you've practiced and be confident of that and, and work with industry and, and um, partner with them and do trials and think of ideas and approach the companies. They'll put money into it. If you have a good idea, they'll be like, let's study it. Yeah, but, but as you said, though, very importantly, is your credibility. It'll take you five or ten years to build credibility, and it'll take you about five or ten minutes to lose it. Right. That's, so, that's scary. Yes, yeah, you definitely. Just talk about what you actually believe in, what you actually do. And if there's a, right. here's another great program. There's a company that wants to work with you, and you don't really use their product much, or you don't believe in their product it's okay to just kindly say no. Say, hey, you know, I just can't give your project the bandwidth that it deserves right now. And so for that reason, I'm going to kindly back up, but please keep me in mind for future projects. That's exactly right. And that's very awkward in the beginning. Yeah. I, I, I remember when I first said that because it was something that I didn't think that it worked that well. Yeah. Well, if I don't think it works that well, then... I can't really speak about it. Then I'm a fraud, right? <laughs> so uh, I, I want, my word means, I want it to mean something. I want, if someone hears me say, okay, I really think that this works, I want them to believe like, okay, this is coming from Priya. This is credible. So, uh, she's a credible source. And I think there's, I want there to be a lot of value in that. And so only speaking about what I believe and what I have experience with, maybe it works, but if I, I haven't really used it in my own patients, then I think I probably shouldn't talk about it. No, of, of course. I think we all believe in that too. So, so yeah. I think yeah, once, once you're, you're true to yourself, it comes across on the podium and you have a very high credibility and, and, and other people, like I love to hear people on the podium who just speak with a passion, as you said. I love it. Right. And I think that, you know, for young surgeons who want to get involved, um, you know, come and introduce yourself and, and, and talk to people. You can have mentors at all different levels, right? People may be just a few years out or 10 years out or 20 years out and, and talk to them. Hey, you're doing this. I'm interested in it. I've had a lot of people who are, for example, freshly out of training or maybe in training that are interested in global health, especially as it applies to cornea transplants. And they'll tell me I'm interested in it. Mm-hmm. Like, great. Let me write down your information. I'll be in touch with you. So don't hesitate to reach out to people when you're interested in something that they're doing, because that's the nice thing about ophthalmology. 
Everyone's pretty friendly. Right. And we like to stay connected. Right. In fact, that's a great pearl. I've reached out to people and for various things. I've never once been ignored or rejected. They'll say, hey, you know, I appreciate reaching out. At this time, I don't have something for you, but I'll keep you in mind. Or they'll say, hey, it's funny you asked. Yeah, we have such and such coming up. But it all is through these connections. And yeah, even for me, people, I get multiple emails a day from people, of course, I don't know. I reply to every one of them. Every single one I reply to. So if you have an idea. It really means a lot. Yeah, if you have an idea, yeah. reach out to someone. Exactly. I have a good story about that, which is Chuck Williamson. As you know, sure. he's absolutely brilliant. And, you know, I remember the first time I saw, for example, Epi Ingrowth with a LASIK patient. Well, who am I going to really ask, mm-hmm. right? Like, well, Chuck writes a lot on refractive surgery lines. Let me just take a shot in the dark and just email him and ask him for advice about this tough case um, for this patient. And since then, we've become pen pals. You know, he's someone that he wrote the most thoughtful, wonderful email back. And there's been a few times when I have, you know, a situation, I'll I'll email him, I'll reach out to him. And he'll reply back, you know, within 24 hours, a detailed email with his experience. And I'm so thankful for that. Only in this field could you get someone like that to write back to someone they don't even know? You know, so right. I finally introduced myself at a meeting. I'm like, hey, I'm Priya. You know, I'm a big fan. <laughs> we're we're, we're pen pals, yeah. Yeah, we're pen pals. Well, and, I think mean, it's um, a neat thing. I, we have such a small field, right? There are maybe 10,000-ish surgical ophthalmologists in the country, maybe 18,000 total ophthalmologists. We're only training 450, 460 a year for the whole country. It's a small, tiny little field. And if you divide that up, like, oh, these are the catechal fracture people, these are the glaucoma ones, these are the retina ones, the peds ones, the neuro ones, it's even a smaller group. And so I have never had an ophthalmologist not help or reply or give me some helpful. It's amazing. It's amazing. And we want it's to see a small other community. Yeah, we, we want, I want to see other ophthalmologists succeed. Yes. Yes. And, and, and it's wonderful. And people are willing to share their knowledge. And, they're, and those people who are, at the, at, the, at the teaching sessions or at wet labs, they want to give you their information yeah. and they say, reach out. You know, I love it when people reach out to me because I'm like, oh, I, hopefully if I have something that can help them, sure, that's great. Everyone wins. Right, right, right. No, of right. course. And these forums have been, you know, I don't know how people did it with that before forums. You know, Karenet, Refractive Surgery Alliance, um, on Facebook, we have Ophthalmology Moms Group, which is a very active group, for, you know, and these three forums, I've learned so much. I mean, these are, this is questions that don't come up in the journal articles yet, mm-hmm. right? These are odd cases or people writing their personal experience when a new lens comes out or tips that, you know, you can't find anywhere else. And I would really encourage whatever your specialty is, be a part of those forums, read those emails. Sure. You know, and, and, and for the younger ones, don't be afraid to ask questions, but, you know, that that's okay. It's not just meant for people who are 20 years into their practice. It's meant for all ages. Right. It's an important concept too. We were talking earlier before we started the podcast that, you know, that often most kind of in their thirties, that are those who are in their fifties and those <laughs> who are in their seventies, that's kind of the, the full spectrum. And so, and everything in between. So 30s is obviously early career, 50s is mid-career where I'm solving now, and 70s is kind of like tail end of the career. And you kind of have to have a little bit of different game plan for each. And you will be at some point, 20 years from now, I'll be one of the old guys and saying, hey, Priya, you'll be 50-something. I'll say, you want to know that a podcast? You? One of the old guys? Never. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm getting there every year, a little closer. But... <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's the amazing part with this stuff. And so that you, you got to have that long-term outlook. With that said, how do you think your work-life balance is going to end up changing over the years? Because you got one method yeah. now, but how's it going to evolve? I think it definitely will. Right now, I think this is, this is a really good place for me. Um, I, I, I actually feel for the first time, especially since working four days a week, that I have a great balance. Sure. I'm actually putting time into my nonprofit you know, I'm going to the gym. I, it's like, well, I, I'm there for my kids' doctor's appointments. So that helps. Even if you can get one afternoon off, I think that's, uh, that's uh, amazing. It's worth, it's worth it for your mental sanity and to have some time 
for yourself and for mm-hmm. parents. I, I would also add every moment that you're not in work, it doesn't mean that you have to either be with your kids or work all the time. You can take some time for yourself. And as a matter of fact, you should. Yeah. So with my first kid, I was always like working, working, working. Okay. Then only with my kid. And I don't feel like I had any me time and I had to learn with time. Actually, I need some to set out some time for myself sure. every single day. And I think every person is different. Some people will do it in the morning. Some people do it in the evening. Some people do it after their kids go to sleep. For me, it's straight from work. I have my gym bag packed every day. Already in the car. I go from work to the gym. Already in the car. If I pass home, it's a black hole and I'll never get out. There will be two toddlers (laughs) on my legs. I'll never be able to leave. Or if I try to work out at home, inevitably I'll start hearing crying, a crash. You know, I'll have to come out and say what's going on. So what I've noticed is like straight from work to go to working out, even if it's 30 minutes yeah, working yeah, out sure. and then I go home and then I'm all in and I'm a better version of myself instead of still being a little grumpy or frustrated right, right. from the day. And I think that, you know, for both my husband and I, our, our, our family dynamics is very different than what we've seen our parents do. Sure. And so don't be afraid to create a family dynamic that works for you, right? No, we have for to, sure. For sure. We, we've seen, and our parents did the best that they could. And, you know, we, we're really grateful to them, but we, we're going to have a different dynamic because we both are working a lot and no one wants to really take a back seat. Mm-hmm. We both, you know, love what we do and that's, that's okay. And for the women out there, you know, I, I find it funny. There's always this double standard, you know, after I had kids, a lot of people would ask me, especially in the family, well, when are you going to start working less? You know, well, you're not going to still operate that much, right? <laughs> no, actually, I, I'm planning to work, you know, just as much and, and, um, and I want to. And, and no one ever tells Joaquin that he works too much. Right. But for me, oh, Priya's working a lot, you know? <laughs> like, no, I love it. You know, I love what I do. And um, communicate with your partner Figure out a balance that works for you. And again, this is going to change. Maybe for a certain number of years, one person has more of a front seat, one person has a little bit more of the back seat at home, and it may switch. Partnership. And that's okay. Yes. And I think that's really, really important. And constant communication about that, it's, it's, it's so important. Yeah, I think our, the generations do change. I think my parents worked incredibly hard. And I didn't see them a lot as a child. And then a lot of the yeah. things that were, you know, kind of important sentinel events were they just missed. And they were just, well, I'm busy, I'm working or whatever. But so I think I've done a little, right. a little bit better job. I've not, been, I've not been great. I've been okay. But I think the next generation, like your generation, will do an even better job. So right. I think, I think, and I think, I think actually the generation after me, you know, I'll even see it, people in their early 20s. They actually, they value this. Um, balance in life. Yeah, they know it a lot better than I did ten years ago. Yeah, well, I'm like, I'm, you know, th- things come in phases. Like ten years from now, you'll have kids that are like thirteen, fourteen. Believe me, you will enjoy your t- your personal time away from them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when they're that age, and they say, "Mom, you're so embarrassing." Ugh, can't I know. See you with you. They probably will say that. All kids do. I, I said it. My kids said it. I mean, it's kind of like that normal teenage brain, but. And I think it's interesting. You go in phases. And then, you know, you, 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 it's, it's 20 years away for you. But one day you'll hit that 50th birthday and you'll say, wow, in the golf course of life, I'm now playing on the back nine, solidly on the back nine. Wow. <laughs> and then you think like, wait a minute. Do I want, it's why I retired from academics last year at 52. I was like, do, what, do I, what do I really value? I value my time and my happiness more than earning more or working harder and it's okay for me. So it's okay again, like you were saying in the beginning, you evolved your career now, you ramped up to that level. Right now you want to do the full spectrum. You want to do this much right. surgery a year, which is a dang good clip. And then maybe in three or five or eight years, you'll change and do a little bit different and you evolve in a different direction. Right, so. exactly. Well, my dream is I'm going to open up a yoga studio, especially for people who are losing vision. That's my... I'm going to do that one day oh, in the really? future. So we, yeah. You'll do the hot yoga I'm a certified and back yoga you'll do the fake yoga. Yeah, exactly. Siesta key. 
<laughs> Maybe, yeah, because I'm a certified yoga teacher, so that's like my real passion. And oh, I started wow. working with the, the lighthouse down here for doing some chair yoga for, for their patients. Sure. And um, so that's something I'd really love to do in a few years. Start oh, you teaching definitely classes. definitely pursue it. Yeah. I encourage everyone, pursue whatever little passion or project you got. Definitely pursue it. And if it can evolve ophthalmology some way or another like you're trying to do, or like I do with Cataract Coach, it makes it even more fun. Exactly. But exactly. Definitely, definitely pursue those projects, for sure. It, it's just so fun. And within ophthalmology, I mean, I really think we're in the best specialty there is. Our meetings are fun. We have such nice people. And there's so much you can do if, you're involved, if you want to be involved in uh, building technology and clinical studies. These companies are looking for people who, who want to be more involved, who will give their input. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot out there. For sure. Well, the one way I could tell, tell med students, med students are wanting sure they do ophthalmologists, that I can prove to you that it's the absolute best field of medicine. And here's how. The industry side people, the people who work for the companies and you know, development of products, et cetera, or sales or whatever they do, they stay in ophthalmology. They may leave company A and go to company B or company C, but they're still in ophthalmology. Whereas you go to cardiology or nephrology or orthopedics or whatever else you do, their their people come from all uh, all other medical industries, and they'll do cardiology for a few years on other special orthopedics. But once exactly. they go ophthalmology, they never leave ophthalmology. They never leave, yeah. or or they, or if they leave, they come back. Right. <laughs> it, it's a wonderful career, and that that really stood out to me from the beginning too. I'm like, they're doing surgery and they're happy. <laughs> Should we train well, more? You know, this is a question I ask the academic people usually, but you have a great insight on this too. Do we need to train more ophthalmologists? We're only 460 a year for the country. Num- the cataract surgery rate since I was in practice at the beginning to now has more than doubled. It's going to increase again in the future. Do we need to train more people? That's a great question. I mean, I know this may be the unpopular opinion, but I kind of feel like we do need more people. No, most people right? agree with you. I mean, most people agree with oh, you. Oh, really? Okay. I don't know if that's on. Unpo- yeah. You know, I think there's enough to go around, you know. More. And, more and than enough. More than enough. And we have this huge booming population and there's a lot of people, there's a lot of technology. We, we don't have enough surgeons. Yeah. And, and sometimes we'll train people, but people, for whatever reason, may decide that surgery is not for them, right? We can't assume that everyone who does an ophthalmology residency is going to want to do surgery. Right. And the number of... They may not work full time either. Exactly. So the number you train is not the number you get as surgeons. Right. And I even think about the residency program. Sometimes it feels, I feel badly because it seems like as certain residency programs are getting, that they're acquiring more hospitals. So you may have only like two, three, four residents. Okay, but now instead of covering three hospitals, they're covering five hospitals. Right. Or covering six. And they're traveling all over. And it's just them, and, and, and it's tough. And the number of patients and the consults, and also in the, in the um, medical legal society that we live in now, okay, well, if you get called for a consult, you've got to see them. Yeah. Even if you know it may just be dry eye, you have to see them anyways, right? And so um, I, think that, I think we need more surgeons. Yeah, I'm with you. Well, we'll see. I, I think ophthalmology as a whole is going to also evolve the same way we evolve our careers. Ophthalmology as a whole is going to end up evolving too. And hopefully yes. we'll, we'll move towards that direction. I know there's some barriers, you know, with some academic rules and regulations in terms of increasing the residency uh, numbers. Right. But I think with time, we'll slowly move in that direction. And I think also if we produce more, it'll mean each of us can have a bit better work-life balance. There's more of us to share the load. Right. That's exactly right. But I, I think, Uday, what you've done with your cataract coach and your videos, it makes a huge impact with the audience that you're, you're reaching. You tell them about the other parts of surgery, the mental stress, yeah. what you do outside of surgery, For sure. you know, mountain biking and everything. And I, I love that because people don't often talk about that. But I think all of those things make you who you are, make you a better surgeon Right? Yes. With, with that said, on the mountain biking, when we go to Deer Valley for this meeting coming up in two weeks, I will only be doing the green, easy trails. <laughs> only the easy one. Sorry. I'm, I'm too risk averse. Not, not, not these days. I'm... To do that. We went, I think we went hiking together last year and then we ended up doing wine tasting. And then... <laughs> so 
<laughs> you you got to find that balance, the work-life balance. And I think, you know, it's important thing too is those meetings, too, we're really good at that. A lot of the meetings now that you'll see, whether it's the A-Coast meeting or, or meetings in Florida or meetings in Hawaii or the Caribbean, you can see the, the meeting organizers are very good at, at having really concentrated, highly efficient lectures and, and interactive sessions with a sufficient amount of time for, like, mental health. Going for yes. a hike, riding the mountain bike, whatever it is. I love that. I mean, the meetings that are done by 12, and then you have the rest of the day to enjoy and, and, and travel and see the area. Those are my favorite kind of meetings. And I think I learn more than sitting in a lecture hall for eight or 10 hours a day. I learn more by doing the intense morning sessions and then afternoons off. Right. You're probably like me. Our mind kind of wanders. Yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> I can't sit there all day. So maybe that's the next phase you go in your career is that you do like, you work only those, those four days a week, but only mornings. And you're like, boom, yeah. afternoon's <laughs> off. Hey, a, a, right. a surgeon can dream, right? <laughs> a surgeon can dream, yeah. Well, no, you're at you're the real place. You work a day and a half, right? It's a, I, I work enough. I, I'm a, I, I certainly could work more. But again, I'm on that, I'm, I'm on that second half of, of life here. And so it's like, do I want to exchange time and happiness for more surgical volume? No. And I had a video of this. I can link it down below. How I value myself is different than how I was taught. I was taught to value mm -hmm. myself as like, well, your job title, your surgical volume, your income, that's how you value yourself. And no, I value myself with like my health, my relationship with my family and friends, the amount of happiness that I can you know, achieve in my projects. And I like some travel in there. Oh yeah. And I also like doing, having a nice title and good, and good surgery and good income. I like, I like it all. But the, the, right. my, my personal pie chart has shifted a lot. Right. And part of it is, you know, culture has changed. The genera There's definitely a difference in the, over the years. Part of it is we all continue to evolve. And I, I think that's a very healthy way, though, to care more about just what we thought it would be like, right? So yeah. there's so many aspects to us, you know, whether it's family life, our own health, our relationships. That's huge. For sure. Right? Uh, uh, that's very meaningful to me. My friends are live all over the country. Anytime I'm in the car, I call one of them. That's smart. I, I don't drive without call. You know, and that's how mm -hmm. I stay in touch with all my friends. Well, you know, um, we, we do surgery on a lot of elderly patients. And one of my favorite habits that I'll, I'll tell you that I've done over the last maybe 20 years even, patients who are 90 plus, I think they have a special place in my heart. And so you'll see a couple of these every week and I'd always ask the 90 plus year old patients, in your life, you have nine, 10 decades of wisdom. What's been the most important? And without a doubt, it's relationships, experiences, time, you know, finding their happiness, whether it's with a project or with way it's work or whatever. But that thing, happiness, experiences, relationships, and their overall health. That's all that matters. Right. Right. And we're, we're honestly, we're blessed to have a career that allows us enough income to be able to enjoy, have those experiences, travel, sure. right? And because and it, it may not be the same, but th that's why this is the best job. You can actually, you know, not work a million hours, but still be able to have a nice life and, a, you know, have a babysitter. That can't be taken for granted. Not everyone is in that same situation, of course. right? Of course. So I, it, it's all about the relationships, I agree. And I think that I'm continuing to learn and I can't wait to hear from all your listeners about advice that they can give me. And, uh, and it's been just such a pleasure to share some of the pearls that I've learned over the years with you, Uday. Oh, thank you. I'm sure all our, our listeners and viewers appreciate it. This podcast was chock full of really great tidbits and pearls. And I'm excited to see where your career goes in the future. If, if there was a chance to bet on you, I'd bet the house. You're going you're gonna to win big time. You're going to do great. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you, you've been awesome. Well, Keenan and I are really, really enjoyed getting to know you better. And we'll see you in Deer Valley. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening and for watching. Remember, we've got a new podcast every single week now. You can get it on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, wherever you like your podcast. Plus, of course, it's on cataractcoach.com and on YouTube. And I will catch you next week for the next episode. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thanks for enjoying that podcast with me. I know you learned a lot because I learned a lot. It was incredible to hear that energy and that enthusiasm, that insight from a young ophthalmologist who's going to absolutely make a huge impact 
in our field together. I want to remind you, we've got a new podcast every single week here on cataractcoach.com, and you can download the audio-only version as well on Amazon, Spotify, Apple, Google, wherever you find your podcasts. Stay tuned next week for yet another great episode. I'll see you then.